the Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Now, before we get started, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Vicki Koblener is a registered dietitian and nutritionist with years of experience in applying a functional approach to nutrition. She develops individualized plans for clients, which are designed to promote wellness, prevent disease, and rebalance optimization of digestion and function. Vicki has extensive experience in using dietary modification, appropriate supplementation, and functional lab testing to achieve optimal wellness. These webinars are made possible through generous donor support, including a grant from Local 25 Teamsters in Boston, Massachusetts. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.com. And now I will turn it over to Vicki. Thanks, Denise. I really appreciate it. And welcome to everybody who's joining us today. Um, I'm excited to talk. I'm always excited to talk about nutrition. But I know that the subject of PANS and PANDAS and also POTS, which is something else I'm going to talk about, is coming up more and more. We're seeing these diagnoses more frequently. And yet, in many cases, we don't really have a good arsenal of tools in which to um, help. Um, so my goal is to figure out, again, what are the underlying alterations in the body that can be helped with nutritional interventions in these disorders? So the first one we're going to talk about is PANDAS. Um, PANS, PANDAS, I'm sure many of you, because you're listening, are aware of it. Um, either you have a child who's suffering from it or know someone who is. And there are some, it, it is an infectious disease process, and there are some clinical signs that are very, very specific to this disorder, which we should always make sure we're aware of. So PANDAS is defined as the presence of clinically significant obsessions, compulsions, and or tics or disordered eating unusually abrupt onset of symptoms or a relapsing remitting course of symptom severity. And so what that means is if you've had a child who's always been anxious and that's been kind of the way they've always been, this may not particularly be PANDAS, but if you have a child who wakes up one day, who has been relatively developmentally you know, typical, and then all of a sudden starts to show these signs and parents will often say it was out of nowhere. Those are the kind of children that we're looking at and, and suspecting that these are actually infectious agents that have caused this alteration. We see it often prepubertally. It is often associated with other neuropsychiatric symptoms such as ADHD, separation anxiety, bedwetting, developmental regressions. Very often you will see these things happen concurrently with the onset of some of the other symptoms. Now PANDAS is associated with strep infections. There are other disorders, PANS, PITANS, et cetera, which are considered to be a similar course, but may not be strep mediated. They may be viral mediated or from another type of infection. Um, and what we know about this, again, it's a, it's a diagnosis of exclusion, which means that you're trying to rule out other things. And if you can't rule out other things, you may default. This may be the most obvious and the most appropriate diagnosis. But again, to underscore, in terms of PANS as opposed to PANDAS, but they are very similar, is the abrupt dramatic onset of these obsessive compulsive behaviors, which can include things like extreme food restriction. It's also a concurrent presence of other neuropsychiatric symptoms. And you can look, generally they're looking at at least two of these seven categories, those seven categories being anxiety, emotional ability, aggression, behavioral regression, deteriorating school performance, motor abnormalities, and somatic symptoms, somatic being body symptoms, so pains, discomforts, et cetera. Um, symptoms are not better explained by a known neurological or medical disorder. So for example, there is a disease called Sydenham's chorea, which does cause people tremors. You know, you wanna rule that out before you decide that the tick is PANS or PANDAS based, but you wanna make sure the child doesn't have Tourette's, for example, but if they're not presenting with those things and those are ruled out, then we look to PANS, PANDAS, et cetera, for a diagnosis. And the other thing that kind of really defines it is this relapsing remitting course. So again, child can get really bad, have a lot of symptoms, be very symptomatic, and then all of a sudden be doing well for a while, and then relapse again. Sometimes it's due to the onset of, uh, of a germ, a virus, a bacteria, et cetera, that actually then makes these symptoms present themselves again. So 
one of the things we know from Susuito, who's one of the primary researchers in this topic, is that we know that there's a broad spectrum of these neuropsychiatric conditions that we talked about, things like anxiety, et cetera, that are presumed to result from, and this is important, a variety of disease mechanisms and have multiple etiologies. So it's not always as simple as one cause, one result. There can be multiple causes that result in similar results. And they can be things like psychological trauma, underlying neurological, endocrine, or metabolic disorders, or a response to infection and neuroinflammation. So there are many different triggers that can result in this type of presentation. And some of the ones that we see the most often are things like infection, whether it be bacterial, viral, or some other type of germ. Now, again, in the case of pandas, which is strep mediated, we're looking at that bacteria, but there are other bacteria and other viruses that can cause PAMS. We also see that food, environment, stress, and things like mass changes in mast cell function, other biochemical aberrations can actually trigger the same onset. So we have so much more research that needs to be done in this area. And we're really just learning about a lot of this, but these are the things we look to as some of the triggers for these diseases. Now, the treatment is divided um, into three parts. Antimicrobials, because we're assuming that most often this is some sort of microbe, whether again, virus, bacteria, yeast, et cetera, a pathogen. So we use antimicrobial treatment as a cornerstone of treatment. We also do things to modulate the immune system. Some of you parents are probably doing IVIG with your children. Um, we also look at psychotherapy, because obviously we want to help with any of the mood and um, neuropsychiatric presentations. And all those pieces should be done at once. You don't want to do one and not the other two. It's really most effective when you're treating all three parts of this triangle at the same time. So, and this just reiterates what we just showed in that little diagram. So you want to treat the symptoms with psychoactive medications as needed, psychotherapies, including cognitive behavioral therapy, which has been shown to be one of the most effective, and other supportive therapeutic interventions. You also want to do antimicrobial support, removing the source of the inflammation, the infection, and adding antimicrobial interventions. And those can be prescriptive, they can be herbal, but we want to make sure that we're doing antimicrobial support. And then you want to treat the disturbances of the immune system with immunomodulatory therapies and anti-inflammatory therapies. So get rid of the infection, calm down the inflammation that that infection produced, and support mind and body. So we also know that how to choose a treatment, because it can be complex and we don't, still don't have enough, as much information as we'd like, we know that the treatment has to be individualized to address the patient's primary symptoms, impairments, and course. So if a child's symptoms are OCD, we're going to be really looking to address those. If a child's symptom is anorexia, we may need a different treatment that deals more with food and food fears, et cetera. So some of that treatment must be individualized based on what their symptomatology is. And sometimes the only reason we know that it is pans, pandas, et cetera, and that it's helping is when the neuroinflammation and the behaviors are resolved when we use these modalities. So there's not always a perfect, there is no really great test to test for this. Really what we have to look at is how a child responds to these interventions. So reinforcing that treating pans and pandas is very complex and it's unique to each child. There's not a lot of research on diet here. There is some limited research, but not a lot. Um, there's also limited data regarding what specific nutrients would be helpful. So we often need to extrapolate that from other things. So for example, if we know that microbes are a problem and infection is a problem, we're gonna use anti-infectives, antimicrobials, et cetera, but the actual studies that have been done specifically for pans and pandas with antimicrobials herbs specifically have not, have not yet been done in any large way. Um, and focusing on modulating the inflammation, addressing the microbes in the ways that we know work for the general population, but not necessarily have been studied directly with pandas and pans. So for me as a dietitian, my nutrition and dietary interventions are gonna be based on these basic premises. I wanna reduce inflammation. I wanna reduce autoimmune responses. I'm not worried if it's specific to pans, pandas or not. I want to just reduce inflammation. I want to modify any gut dysfunction that exists because gut dysfunction is so often, number one, linked to 
autoimmune responses and increased inflammation, but also when we're using antimicrobials, which are also often antibiotics to treat pans pandas, we're killing that good bacteria in the gut, which is so important for modulating inflammation. So there is a cycle there that needs to be supported. We have to help treat what we've kind of gotten rid of when we're treating the infection. We want to support the reduction of specific symptoms. As I said, if a child has OCD, we're going to use certain herbs, certain supplements, certain nutrients that have been shown to help with OCD. If the child is suffering from anorexia, we're going to be using some different ones because that have more specificity for that. We're going to manage strep and any other pathogens. We're going to try to use agents that kill that naturally. And we're also going to be targeting the child's food restrictions and any limited diet that ensued, partly just because they may have another comorbidity and also partly because it's a result of this infection. So let's think again about some of the background. Active strep infections, for example, in pandas will lead to antibiotic use to kill the strep. So then when you then you have the strep infection, pandas results, you need additional antibiotics to treat the pandas. We know that the stress of the pandas negatively affects the gut microbiome, the good bacteria that live in the gut. So it's going to make the condition worse. Then we know that pandas kids very often have comorbid digestive problems such as celiac disease or dysbiosis, dysbiosis being that imbalance of good and bad bacteria in the gut. So we're seeing these comorbid digestive problems. So they have stress affecting their gut, digestive problems affecting their gut, antibiotics killing their good bacteria, and then the dysbiosis that results, the fact that they probably have not enough good bacteria and too much undesirable germs then impairs immune function. And immune function is what we need to support in order to fight the pandas. So it's a vicious cycle that we need to use all, all of our arsenal to address. Um, some facts that are of importance here are, we know that 23 million Americans, or about 8%, have an autoimmune disease. So it may, it's not as rare as many people think. We also know that 70% of our immune system is located in the GI tract. So much of that history, that autoimmune disease prevalence may be linked to dysfunctions in the gut. And we also have seen in repeated studies, this is just one, that there is correlation between digestive diseases such as Crohn's, celiac, et cetera, and autoimmune disease such as things like rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes mellitus, multiple sclerosis. So they are linked. The gut and the immune function, the immune system are linked. And in pandas, this all comes, to, and pans, this comes together very clearly because the gut is not functioning, the antibiotics reduce its function, and then we can see exacerbation of the inflammation. Um, so basically, one of the things we know is that when we work on improving digestion and we improve the balance of good flora, you will have a functional effect on immune and nervous system health. We know this. So in a case like PANS, PANDAS, or even POTS, we want to really work from the nutritional standpoint on balancing that gut flora and supporting digestion. So as with autism, a lot of the goals are the same. We're targeting dysbiosis. We want to rebalance that microbiome. We want to make sure what we're feeding are nutrient-dense foods because any stressed body has a much, much higher need for nutrients because they use those nutrients to help address the stress. We want to use rich, unprocessed plant foods clean sources of protein and fat. We want to make sure that we're not giving junk, we're not giving artificial ingredients, because those things can be very inflammatory. We want to use lots of anti-inflammatory compounds, whether they come from herbs or foods, but there's many, many in, in our diets and in our, in our pantries that we can use to support the reduction of inflammation. And for those people with reduced appetites and anorexia, a focus on a higher fat diet and frequent small meals is often very beneficial. So those are the focuses, the general focuses. So as I usually do, I break it down into phases. The first one being removing toxins. So what are the toxins in our diet? Pesticides, colorings, preservatives, sweeteners, all of these artificial synthetic additives, hormones, antibiotics, pesticides, all of those can be pro-inflammatory. In addition, sugar is one of our greatest, the, the things that is most pro-inflammatory that we ingest. So using organic foods, getting rid of artificial ingredients, and removing sugar are some of the most powerful things you can do before you start on any type of 
special diet, so to speak. Those really can have a profound effect on reducing inflammation. So that's where you want to start. We want to add things that are anti-inflammatory as well. So something like bone broth. Bone broth is made from the long simmering, um, the long simmering of bones to make a broth. The bones, the broth has acid added to it. That's what makes it different from a typical stock. You add acid to the bones. What then happens is the acid will help leach a lot of the nutrients from the bones, and it will go into the broth. So the broth is rich in collagen. It's it all, does have glutamine in it, which some people may react to, but in general, glutamine can be very healing to the gut. It's also richer in things like calcium and magnesium because they come from the bones. So bone broth can be a very, very soothing, healing to the intestines, and also nutrient-rich. We also want to use fermented foods. And some people don't understand the difference between, say, a pickle you might get in the local grocery store and a lacto-fermented pickle. But a pickle in the grocery store basically has been dipped in vinegar just to have that tart flavor, flavor and brined. Lacto-fermented foods actually use natural fermentation processes to make that tangy, slightly sour, acidic flavor so that you see in things like sauerkraut and pickles, um, kimchi, miso, those are fermented foods as well, natural yogurt without the added sugars can be helpful for those who tolerate dairy. Kombucha or kefir are also fermented. Any fermented food which is naturally lacto-fermented is going to be rich in good bacteria and help colonize the gut. So they're a really great part of most healthy diets. In addition, we want to use things like anti-inflammatory plants. And there's many of those that we'll talk about in more detail as they go forward. And then antimicrobial foods, herbs, and spices. And you know, foods like Garlic is a great antimicrobial. Rosemary is a great antimicrobial. There's lots and lots of herbs and spices in our pantry that we can use to help. The other thing we want to do is remove foods that can be pro-inflammatory, gluten casing being two of the most common. And again, there is research, preliminary research, that shows that gluten especially may be linked to things like both pans, pandas, and pots, and that gluten intolerance is a problem there, and removing gluten can alleviate some symptoms. Again, the other thing we know about both gluten and casein is that we see increased antibodies to these. And the, those, they can result in things that, you know, responses that impair cognition, focus, and relatedness. They do increase inflammation. We also know that there is some opioid activity that can be expressed because gluten and casein are both really similar to morphine in their molecular structure, and they may cross the blood-brain barrier and act like an opiate. Gluten foods are also high in FODMAPs. FODMAPs are a type of food that can be inflammatory to the gut. They're also high in oxalates and lectins, which we also know can cause gut problems with the gut and problems with digestion. We also know that gluten interferes with something called glutamate decarboxylase, which you need to convert to GABA, and GABA is calming. So for children who are stressed or having OCD, we really want to get them calmer and we want to allow their body to do the normal process of moving glutamate into GABA, and gluten can interfere with that. We also know that milk protein is correlated with a number of different autoimmune diseases that, can, that will increase inflammation. So for many reasons, it's prudent to remove these two from the diet. And here is just one study showing the incidence of autoimmune diseases linked to celiac. So we see that gluten autoimmune connection right there. Once we've done that, then I start looking at other special diets, things like food allergens or histamines or glutamates, phenols, oxalates, specific carbohydrate or GAPS diet, or the autoimmune paleo. Those are just of some of the many diets that people use to help reduce inflammation. And one of the things I want to be real clear about here is I think sometimes parents hear from their health carers or their other parents or support groups about a diet that worked for a specific child and they wanna jump on that diet, understandably so. But it's really important to understand why you might do a certain diet, what the impact it has on your kids, and also very often what, what I am concerned with, and I just wanna say this as a caution to all parents out there, I see parents who will layer one diet on top of another. So first they'll pull out histamines, then they'll pull out glutamates, then the blood oxalates because they're worried that these are causing reactions. The problem is that we end up with a child who may not be getting fed. And so one of the pieces of 
support is not only removing the things that cause a problem, but providing a nutrient-dense diet that provides the building blocks to make the immune system healthy. And when there's not enough variety or, or too many foods are limited in the diet, kids can actually become nutritionally depleted and their immune system will not function properly if that's the case. So it's really important to do this carefully and with help. So let's talk a little bit about the different types of diets that we do consider. Food allergies are one, very common. We I try to identify and avoid those foods that can have a role in increasing inflammation. Um, accurate testing here is really difficult because there are no really, really good tests for food allergies and sensitivities. None of them are, you know, have a high reliability factor. So a lot of it is trial and error. But some of the most common is gluten, obviously, and then dairy, the two I mentioned. And then we think about things like soy, peanuts, tree nuts, eggs, fish, and shellfish are very common. Other common sensitivities include things like corn, bananas, phenols, but it really could be any food. I've had kids who are sensitive to beef. I've had kids who are sensitive to coconut. I've had kids who are sensitive to different vegetables. We just have to try to find out what the food is, and sometimes that's a trial and error process. Histamine is another thing that can cause problems for many people. Um, it can cause a lot of issues within the gastrointestinal tract we see that it can include, we can result in things like gastrointestinal discomfort, food allergies, irritable bowel, IBD, histamine is, can cause all kinds of disruptions in the gut. And when that happens, it can also really be very pro-inflammatory. We don't know 100% how to deal with it, but one of the ways is to reduce histamines in foods. And histamines in foods generally come from things like aged foods, so often if you're going to, you know, it, we know we don't all want to cook every single day, but if you have leftovers and you have a histamine issue, you don't want to put them in the refrigerator. You actually want to freeze your leftovers immediately because as they sit in the fridge, we know that our food can go moldy. As they age, they're increasing the level of histamine. This is where fermented foods can become difficult too because fermented foods are generally high in histamines. So for some people, even though we know that fermented foods can be so wonderful for typical gut health, there is a subset of people who may not do well with them. And if that's the case, we want to look at histamines as a potential cause. Things like tomatoes, eggplants, and spinach are also high in histamines. And cheeses, so again, aged foods. Cheeses are a very typical example. And there's a good website called healinghistamine.com that can give you a list of high histamine foods. But again, before you pull histamines out, you really want to understand why you're doing it and whether it is the primary thing that your child may be reactive to. Glutamates are another very excitatory compound. They can cause excess neurotransmission in the brain, chronic brain inflammation. Many of the most typical food sources include monosodium glutamate, anything on a label that says hydrolyzed proteins. So again, looking at those, you know, avoiding artificial ingredients in your food, you're gonna be avoiding a lot of these things. However, natural flavors can also contain glutamate. And foods like peas and mushrooms and tomatoes and cheese, and as I said, bone broth can be high in glutamate. So there are foods that we think of as very healthy foods that in particular cases may not be so healthy for us. We want to be careful about that. And again, notice cheeses are high in glutamate. They're high in histamine. They're high in inflammatory compounds. So, you know, again, dairy on the whole is probably best removed in many of these diets. Now, there are herbs and other compounds that act as anti-glutamate, things like pycnogenol and rosemary, lemon balm, magnesium, taurine, GABA, theanine, skullcap, and chamomile are some that act, again, as anti-glutamates and help, can help support somebody who's having a problem tolerating glutamates. So we want to reduce the glutamates in the food, and we want to add these anti-glutamate herbs and compounds so we can help support the body's ability to tolerate them. Another diet that we see very commonly used is fail-safe or other fine gold fail-safe phenol and salicylate removal type diets. And these eliminate the things that you and I, have, we've already talked about, artificial food additives, colorings, preservatives, all that artificial stuff can be very excitatory. It's inflammatory. It drives up that inflammatory response, disrupts the immune process and makes and stresses out our kids. Salicylates and polyphenolic foods and medications 
Now this includes many fruits and vegetables. So it's not as easy as just saying, get rid of the artificial foods. There are many foods, polyphenols are found um, in almost all foods and some higher than others, but many fruits and vegetables are sources of that. So we have to be careful. There are specific lists of high salicylate and high to help pull those out of the diet. And I tend to always say we should be trialing these first because we want to try, see if we see an improvement when we take these foods out. And if we don't, then it may not be necessary to pull them out. Now we find glutamates and amines are also tr triggers for phenol and salicylate problems. We've just discussed glutamates. We know that they can be problematic and they can be neuro, neuro excitatory. So we want to remove those. And again, aged proteins, aged cheeses, aged animal protein, fermented foods are going to be the ones that are the biggest problem here. And then aromatic chemicals, those beautiful scents in our perfumes, in our personal care lotion, things like that, in our candles, those actually are very problematic for many people and are unnecessary. So it's important that we get rid of those and just use natural products for cleaning and for home care and personal care. And then there are a number of medications that actually also are high in phenols and salicylate. Now, another diet that I utilize a lot in my arsenal is a low oxalate diet. Oxalates are molecules that link with minerals, such as calcium, most predominantly calcium, and they crystallize. And when they crystallize, they actually make sharp crystals. And those sharp crystals can exacerbate inflammation. They can actually be painful, physically painful to pass. Um, think about a kidney stone. A kidney stone is a type of crystal. And it's terribly difficult to pass because it scratches you up. Now, it's painful. So we know that kids with leaky gut, again, dysbiosis, an imbalance of good and bad bacteria, are going to have increased oxalate absorption. We also know that low levels of lactobacillus, that good bacteria, reduces the body's ability to degrade oxalates and get rid of them. We also know that low B6 and sulfur, which are very common in kids on the spectrum, we don't have evidence about that for kids with pans and pandas, but we can, we can you know, guess that it may be possible that they have that, but we do know that low B6 and sulfur does result in excess oxalates. So all of these things that increase oxalates are gonna increase that crystal formation, cause pain, discomfort, can also affect brain health. Another diet that I use regularly is specific carbohydrate and or GAPS. And I put those together because they are based on the same principles and are quite similar in many ways. We use them when intractable yeast cannot be resolved with a low yeast diet or continued antifungal therapy. And again, remember, we're treating dysbiosis in these kids because that's the gateway to good gut health and good gut health leads to good immune health. So anything we can do to help normalize the gut and maximize its function is, can be beneficial for immune modulated issues. With SED and GAPS, we remove all grains and complex sugars that can ferment in the gut and feed the yeast. So it's not the same thing as just using gluten-free grains. We're using no grains at all. The diet is focused on protein, vegetables, fruits, and healthy fats with controlled amounts of nuts and nut flours and some legumes as well. It includes all dye and polysaccharides. What that means is two sugar and multi-sugar compounds. Fruits are a single sugar compound, so they are allowed. But we wanna get rid of those because what you find is that when the digestive function is impaired, these carbohydrates can kind of sit around in the gut for longer than they need to. And as they sit around, instead of being digested by us, they're digested by the yeast and they feed the yeast and help it grow. And that is exactly what we want to avoid. Now there was a recent, there was a study done last year about the specific carbohydrate diet for pediatric IBD. And it actually showed a very positive response for pediatric patients who used the specific carbohydrate diet who had inflammatory bowel disease. So we know that the specific carbohydrate diet can in fact improve gut health and reduce those symptoms. Another diet that I sometimes use it's called autoimmune paleo. And again, autoimmune is in the name. This is a diet that people use who have chronic autoimmune diseases and cannot get, you know, and need to overcome the symptoms of that because it can be so debilitating. So it's a paleo-based diet, paleo being one that also gets rid of all grains, 
focus is on the things that our ancestors used to eat, which include animal proteins, lots of vegetables and fruits. It avoids beans, it avoids grains, anything that needed to be processed before cooking. Now the autoimmune paleo goes a little farther because even within the paleo diet, there are foods that are considered somewhat inflammatory. So not only do we get rid of all the processed foods and the grains, but it also gets rid of nuts and seeds because we know they can be high allergen. It also gets rid of beans and legumes, things like dried fruits and even things like xylitol and stevia. Eggs are removed. Nightshade vegetables such as eggplant and tomato are removed. Many, some culinary herbs are removed as well as things like chocolate and alcohol and tapioca. So it is a difficult diet, it's quite limited, but it can have profoundly positive effects on somebody who's suffering from autoimmune disease. Now, with any of these diets, I really like to caution people, as I said before, there is a risk of providing a child with a limited diet. We need to make sure that that seesaw or that scale is balanced. We don't want to err so far on the side of removing foods that are inflammatory that we've also removed their source of nutrients. We want to make sure we've balanced a child's need for good nutrition and supportive nutrients with the removal of any inflammatory processes. We also want to really carefully think about the effect of dietary limitations on kids with anorexia and OCD. Because when we're looking at PANS and PANDAS, we do know that a lot of these kids are suffering from things like anorexia and OCD. And if we make food something that they can then start to obsess about, or the anorexia is really limiting what they're eating anyway, the most important thing you need to do is make sure they are fed. Because if kids are not fed, they're not going to get better. So we've got to be really, really careful about placing these limitations on them. And it is it is a tightrope that we have to walk very often in terms of making sure the diet is nutrient dense and they feel safe and comfortable with their food at the same time we're taking away things that can be problematic. And of course, underscoring what I'm saying here, which is making sure that the diet is nutritionally adequate. And I don't generally use things like the DRIs or those, you know, the R what people used to call the RDAs to define nutritional adequacy. Because very often with chronic illness, our nutrient needs are much increased. Stress and illness deplete us of nutrients. So when we're sick, we need lots more of those same nutrients that we might need if we were healthy. The other thing about nutritional adequacy is that most of those DRIs or RDAs, whatever you'd like to call them, are based on what we call um, diseases of deficiency. So in the olden days, people used to have low vitamin C and get scurvy, or they would be low in B vitamins and get things like pellagra. We don't really suffer from those diseases anymore. But those, we, we tend to suffer more from diseases of overconsumption of problematic inflammatory foods like sugar, um, processed foods, things like that. Now, with the DRIs though, those levels were designed to avoid those deficiency diseases. They weren't designed for optimal therapeutic amounts of nutrition. So we can often go much higher in the amount of those nutrients that we consume to have a therapeutic effect than we would have just to avoid a deficiency. So I did want to touch a little bit also on anorexia in pandas and pans and the fact that we, we have looked at kids with infection-triggered anorexia, kids who had pandas pans, and they were able to improve when they use conventional treatment for anorexia with the addition of antibiotics and that their eating disorder behaviors and their OCD symptoms decreased when they were able to get both antibiotics and supportive therapy. So we know, we see there that link between infectious disease and anorexia. And we have to be very aware of that in anyone presenting with anorexia, that there may be an infectious trigger here and it may not just be completely psychiatric in nature. So in order to treat the gut, some of the things I like to use are probiotics, and I like to make sure they're very high quality. They are third party tested, every lot is tested, and the manufacturer follows good manufacturing principles. If not, you may be getting garbage because probiotic, all supplements are unregulated in this country. So we, want, we need to be very, very careful about the source of our supplements, 
both the brand names and where we get them because counterfeiting of supplements is also rampant. In terms of probiotics, we want to use a multi-strain and a high dose. I also like to use Saccharomyces boulardii very often because Saccharomyces boulardii helps address yeast overgrowth in a more gentle way very often. And as it, at the same time, it supports gut-mediated immunity and it also helps grow good bacteria. So it can be really, really helpful. Now I get questions often about strep thermophilus. Strep thermophilus is a type of strep that you will find in a number of different probiotics. It is not the same strain of strep that we see with pans and pandas. So technically, it's not even, it actually is lacking a particular protein that causes the problem. So theoretically, strep thermophilus should not have a problem, should not be a problem for people who have pans and pandas. But anecdotally, I've heard enough parents say that they felt that when they switched to a strep free strain, their children did better. That I tend to recommend that we use a strep free strain of probiotic in kids with pans, pandas, et cetera. But from a research standpoint, we do not have any evidence that really supports that. Now, when we talk about strep, again, there are many different strains of strep. There is a product called Bliss K12, which helps prevent strep and viral pharyngeus tonsillitis in children. Now, basically that's throat infections. We see Bliss K12 has a good history of getting rid of those infections. We don't know if that means it's going to reduce the incidence of pandas, but it seems to me that it's something that actually tastes pretty good. It's easy to give, and we do know that it increases the risk of strep infections. So prophylactically, it may be very helpful to reduce the relapsing and remitting course of, pans, of pandas in kids who have already suffered from it. We also know that xylitol has anti-strep activity. Again, not the same type of strep. This is, this is strep mutans, but again, we know that we can reduce cavities and we can reduce bacteria in the oral cavity, which can help maintain health and reduce relapsing from strep-mediated infections. So again, one study showing how xylitol can help reduce bacteria. Now here is another I thought this was an interesting study that really just looks at the different herbs that can inhibit strep species. And this is just one page from a monograph about all the different herbs that help reduce strep. So once again, we know that utilizing herbs can be very helpful. And the one at the top there is ginger. And I love using ginger for many reasons, but it can be a very, very good antimicrobial. So let's talk about the herbs and spices we want to add to the diet the ones that are anti-inflammatory and the ones that are antimicrobial. So reducing inflammation and killing germs. Curcumin, ginger, garlic, cinnamon, and parsley are some of my favorite anti-inflammatory herbs and they can be used liberally. People also take them as supplements, but please use them freely in the diet. Cook with them generously, make lots of foods that are rich in these compounds. In terms of antimicrobials, oregano, cinnamon, garlic, rosemary, berberine, grapefruit seed, and olive leaf are some wonderful, wonderful antimicrobial herbs. Now you'll see cinnamon and garlic are both anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial. A number of these herbs go both ways, but garlic and cinnamon particularly can be good for both, and they're wonderful herbs to use, to use regularly in the diet. Now for kids with anorexia, an appetite stimulant can be very helpful, and things like mint, spearmint and peppermint, Things like bitter melon and barberry are also good. Bitters can actually improve appetite. So even though we don't always love the way they taste, a little bit of bitters can help to improve appetite. A couple of research studies point to the powerful, powerful effect that curcumin can have on inflammation. And you know, if you did a literature search, you would find many, many papers that discuss this. But curcumin is a powerful anti. We also know things like moving away from herbs and looking at nutrients, things like zinc, copper, manganese, iron, calcium, and magnesium, so minerals. Minerals can really impact OCD behaviors. And when people are supported with good mineral support, sometimes we see that some of those behaviors can either reduce or resolve. B6, 
has been used in the treatment of Tourette syndrome. So for those children who are ticking, we might want to consider magnesium and B6 in therapeutic doses for them. Inositol is another B, B vitamin derivative compound. And we know we have, we have studies that show that when we use inositol to treat OCD, we see reduction in symptoms. Now, we, it's a very high dose. 18 grams per day was the dose used in this study. Um, but using inositol can help with OCD behaviors in some people. Tryptophan is an amino acid, can be very supportive in helping resistant OCD. Again, very, very small study, but it had good response. N-acetylcysteine, another compound helpful in refractory treatment of OCD. So there are many, many nutrients and many herbs that can be helpful. Omega-3s, again, powerful anti-inflammatory activity. And we have seen benefit in the, with the use of omega-3s in Tourette's. So for ticks, we may want to consider essential fatty acids. And in everybody, essential fatty acids can be helpful in reducing inflammation. One of the other things I'll throw out there that we don't have any direct research with pans and pandas on is the therapeutic potential of helminths in autoimmune disease. There is a lot of emerging research about the role of helminths in autoimmunity. And anecdotally, we hear many parents talking about their benefit. Of course, you want to only use them under the auspices of a good... Do you have some, some role, may have some role in helping mediate these autoimmune disorders? Now, other options that are often used, I, I found less clinical evidence for them, but they, uh, for PANS, but they have been used with some success in PANDAS. Things like lecithin, L-carnitine, transfer factor, 5-HTP, taurine, grape seed extract, neem. Neem is another one that's used fairly often and can be quite helpful. Um, and mast cell stabilizers, because again, mast cells are involved in the inflammatory process. And so when we stabilize those mast cells, we can also help reduce some of that response. So in summary, we don't really have enough clinical evidence to define a PANDAS PANDAS protocol nutritionally, but if we use good clinical judgment and we use the tools we know to address the symptomatology, we can still provide help and relief for kids' symptoms. The diet has to be nutrient dense, unprocessed, whole, free of food allergens. We have to use gut healing modalities. We need to address the strep, other pathogens, and other stressors, add immune modulating foods and herbs, and then replenish depleted vitamins and minerals. And that would be the protocol and the standard by which we would evaluate any diet that we were going to want to use for a child who was suffering from one of these things. Now, I also wanted to talk about POTS and dysautonomia briefly. It's a different disorder, but we're seeing a lot of similarities here. What we're seeing for those of you who don't know what POTS is, it's postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and it is a type of dysautonomia. Dysautonomia meaning your autonomic immune, uh, your autonomic system is not working properly. Now, the autonomic nervous system is the one that regulates things you don't think about, things like breathing and heart rate and digestion. You don't spend your day saying, okay, I have to digest my food now, it happens naturally. So when nervous system is dysregulated, we see changes in blood pressure. We see abnormal heart rate, blood pressure, changes in digestion, body temperature alterations, pupil responsiveness, poor response to stress and sweat and things like that. We also see what we call orthostatic intolerance, which means dizziness, lightheaded, fatigue, nausea, and perspiration. And that has to do with when you rise from, seat, from laying down to standing. When you get dizzy, that's your orthostatic balance. Um, we also see abdominal pain, diminished cognitive function, tremors, headaches, and sleep disruption. And there is some evidence that B12, which supports adrenaline, um, can help. Because again, the adrenal system is also part of this autonomic response. And when we support the adrenal, sometimes we improve it. But there is a lot of evidence um, that POTS is also autoimmune in nature. So we're going to cycle back around to the whole concept of auto, autoimmunity and how we need to work with that dietarily and nutritionally. Now, the standard protocol for POTS 
is really one that focuses very much on hydration because fainting is a big problem here and the, that lack of regulation of the nervous system. So hydration, avoiding prolonged sitting. This is the standard protocol you can read about. Um, avoiding warm environments that make you sweat too much. Minimizing any medications that dilate your blood vessels because when you dilate the blood vessels, it also reduces your blood pressure. We wanna make sure this is, a, this is a disorder where salt intake is important and lots of salt is helpful to, to keep that blood pressure up. Alcohol worsens symptoms. Very many people may use things like support or pressure garments, again, to make sure that we're keeping that blood pressure, you know, we're keeping pressure against the blood, the vessels. We also need adequate sleep and keeping the head of the bed elevated helps when you rise in the morning from having that dizziness and avoiding stress as much as possible is very important. Now, other considerations, in addition to the ones that we mentioned, some of these repeat them, we also add a few. So increasing fluid intake is absolutely essential. 80, you know, 80 ounces a day of fluid is not unrealistic. Increasing salt is absolutely mandatory. So these are things that we don't necessarily see in some of the other disorders, but that are very, very important in POTS. Making sure that the blood pressure remains elevated or, or normal, you know, elevated from, from the dysautonomic normal, which is low. Avoid standing or sitting for long periods, using those compression socks, getting adequate seat, sleep, I exercise, though, is also very, very important. Most people with POTS are so exhausted that they have trouble exercising, and so they need to start very slow, but exercise actually helps blood pressure and helps to maintain the, the good, the, the normal blood pressure. Um, in terms of diet, we also look at things like avoiding processed foods, avoiding artificial foods and artificial sweeteners, because those things can also cause inflammation and if we're looking at POTS as being autoimmune in nature and inflammatory in nature, we want to reduce those. We know that B12, again, supports adrenaline, and we see that it can improve fatigue and brain fog. But we also know that iron and minerals, things like zinc and magnesium, may be effective in supporting some of these issues. Now, magnesium is often depleted in people who are stressed or ill, so that's one of the reasons magnesium may be very helpful. In addition, we want to use antioxidants. Anything that's going to reduce inflammation may be helpful. And these considerations come from Jeff Boris, who, is, who runs the POTS clinic. He's the MD that runs the POTS clinic at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And he is one of the premier experts on POTS at this time. Now, in terms of nutrition goals, yes, we have to admit, treating POTS is complex, and we don't know a whole lot nutritionally about what to do. The role of diet requires a lot more research. And other than managing fluid and, you know, the potential data regarding specific nutrients, but there is some. So again, we're extrapolating some information from other disorders, but we do have some information about POTS. The focus in this case has to be on maintaining blood pressure and supporting the adrenal system because those are the two things that really are the most disrupted. And then because of their impact on other things, they can have far-reaching far -reaching effects on how the person is feeling. Now again, um, POTS is usually a disorder that seems to come on in puberty. Some people are known to grow out of it by their 20s or 30s, but we're seeing more and more diagnoses of POTS and we're learning more and more about it every week, every month, every year. Um, and again, wanna reinforce that theory that POTS may be autoimmune mediated is something that's being explored right now. And we'll, you know, so, but we can assume or act as if and support immune function just in case. So again, nutrition and POTS reinforce over and over, fluid and salt, but B12 also very supportive, and a gluten-free diet. There is some data that people on a gluten-free, there's a higher incidence of celiac disease in POTS patients, and that a gluten-free diet may help some symptomatology. We also wanna replace those minerals such as magnesium, zinc, and iron that can be depleted, support the adrenals, with both herbs, there are many herbs called adaptogens, such as ashwagandha, rhodiola, bacopa. Adaptogenic herbs are very helpful at supporting normal adrenal function and can be very helpful. We suspect can be very helpful in this case. So I think it's very important to support the adrenals. And believe it or not, the adrenal system uses salt. So while we have been told all the time that we need to avoid salt and be careful about salt in our diet, in fact, those who are stressed, it makes a lot of sense to use that salt both for blood pressure 
but also to support the adrenal. We also want to address autoimmunity or inflammation, and there is also some research, really, again, emerging research, very limited, but that lowering carbohydrates can be helpful in reducing dysautonomia. So those would be some of the primary goals for a child or a teenager with POTS. So in conclusion, these are all disorders, POTS, PANS, PANDAS, that were rarely heard of 20 years ago. We're now estimating POTS to be somewhere around one in 100 people have it. And PANS is now estimated at about one in 200. So these are no longer rare. We don't know enough about how to treat them nutritionally, but what we do know is that nutrient-dense foods are gonna provide those building blocks for support. Anti-inflammatory foods and herbs are gonna help reduce the inflammation that all of these children are suffering with. Targeted nutrients can enhance not only those things that are depleted, but the increased need that has existed by chronic disease, and that we wanna use adrenal support because chronic illness stresses the adrenals overall. And what we wanna avoid are inflammatory foods germs and toxins we did no have, we did have quite a few questions so there are some common threads in the questions and the the first thread i want to pick up on you talked quite a bit about um dairy and different foods uh one of the questions was about camel milk so asking about is camel milk different uh how does that relate to the discussion of inflammation uh good question and we are not 100 percent sure I would say my go-to answer when it comes to dairy and camel's milk is there's a lot of you know emerging, really interesting information about camel's milk. I've seen kids do very well with it. My feeling is when we take dairy out, we take it out completely for a trial, including no camel's milk, no goat milk, no nothing. And then if we wanna go back and try camel milk after a month or two, or you know, sometimes I say three months, but if we're really, really looking for help and we're struggling, we can maybe try it earlier. But again, I think a fully dairy-free diet with a challenge of camel milk down the road would be appropriate because there is a lot of information about camel milk being more anti-inflammatory, so in fact, maybe helpful. So I don't want to rule it out, but I would never do a dairy-free diet that included camel milk from the outset because it may be causing a problem, and then we would assume that the dairy removal wasn't helpful, and really it was the camel's milk. Okay, this person's asking about salt. Is there a superior way to deliver salt in the diet? What's the best way to do that? Salt your food. Um, you know, again, I like to use things like sea salt or Himalayan pink salt, or there's a number of different, you know, good salts that are more rich in nutrients, but as opposed to, you know, processed salt that we buy in the local grocery store. But, you know, again, we're talking pots, but also, you know, just for adrenal support overall, salt can be really important. There are people who can't get enough salt. In terms of pots, there are people who cannot get enough salt from their food without it becoming, you know, from a taste pers perspective, unpleasant. And for those, they take salt pills. You can actually buy salt pills and just take them. And so for those who can't get enough salt through the diet, you can use salt pills. Okay, great. Um, asking a little bit more about fermented foods and histamine reactions. So would it be your recommendation that people flat out, they just have to make their own or are there reliable brands where they can go and purchase? Uh, For fermented foods? Yeah, fermented foods. Oh yeah, you can buy fermented foods in the grocery store. Um, there's a couple of brands that make them national. Okay, so there's a company called Zukai, there's a company called Wheel Pickles, um, and they make a variety of different lacto-fermented foods. But in my local grocery store, we have local, you know, like in the produce, you're going to find them in the produce section, number one. They're not, even though they're in jars, often you're going to, they need to be refrigerated. You're not going to find them on the shelf. You're going to find them in, by the produce area, and they're going to be kept cold. Um, Bubby's Pickles is one that's naturally lacto-fermented that's readily available. But you can also find, at least in my local stores, I will see small packages of lacto-fermented vegetables made by local farms. So those are great. If you don't want to make your own, you can buy those. And they, as long as it, what you're really looking for is lacto-fermented. You know, if you go and buy a pickle or a sauerkraut from the local grocery store, as I said, 
they're just vinegared, essentially. They're not really fermented. So you want to look for something that says on the label that is naturally lacto-fermented. And those are great. The next question. Oh, you can buy that. You can you can order them online too. If you don't have them locally, you can order them online. Okay. The next question is about nutrition sourcing or supplement sourcing. So you were talking a little bit about uh, some of the problems of getting adequate and and well sourced supplements. So what are your recommendations for purchasing supplements? My recommendations are purchase them from somebody you work with that you trust. Um, I sell them. Um, many healthcare practitioners, you know, who are functional in nature do sell them. There are a couple of online stores. I don't tend to necessarily endorse any of them, but I will tell you that places like Amazon are not the place to get them. I know I've had clients say to me, well, I can get them cheaper when I get them on Amazon, but I've had some of my vendors, many that you're, you know, this, this audience knows well, go and purchase their own product from places like Amazon and then put them through their labs to test them and see if they're actually still viable, still functional, contain what they should, and many times they don't. So my biggest thing is, you know, if somebody's spending their money trying to support their children and they're trying to save some money on a less expensive product and it turns out that less expensive product is either counterfeit or dead, you know, in terms of something like a probiotic, they're no, the, the organisms are no longer alive, then they've just wasted their money. And when you can't put a face to the person that you bought your supplements from, you don't know if what you're getting is counterfeit or not. So it's important that you use companies that are good quality that do what I call third party testing and batch test every and, and test every lot because those are the ones that really stand by their product. Okay. So the next question, uh, this question comes up almost every time we do a webinar on uh, nutrition. So this is about getting a diet underway, getting a diet started. Um, several parents have said it's incredibly challenging, particularly when you've got the considerations about OCD or if you've got anorexia. So oh, yeah. what, what are the, is there a particularly good way to start? I mean, if you've got a complicated case like that, is it best to work directly with a nutritionist to find that kind of support? Or are there resources online that they might look at? Um, you know, most of the PANS, PANDAS resource networks are excellent and they do have support for things like this. There is no one easy answer. Um, I'm actually giving a lecture at the New England Pans Pandas um, Association this weekend and we're gonna be talking about some of this in a little more detail. But it is very, it is very hard. That's, that's the only answer. Um, I often start with one thing at a time. Using CBT can be really helpful to help address cognitive behavioral therapy to address some of the fears around food. Again, really focusing on what's the most nutrient dense thing I can give somebody. So if they just simply need calories, if we've got anorexia going on and they're really low in calories, we're going to be trying to get more fat into them. Um, if they drink, let them drink. If they chew, let them chew. If they um, only like certain textures, focus on those textures. If there are certain flavors that are more acceptable, then focus on that. If the food needs to look a certain way, you know, we try to help it look a certain way. But the same way we treat or we address the OCD that, that manifests itself in other ways, we have to use that for the nutrition piece too. So what is going to think, make them feel the most safe? If it has to be on a particular plate, if it has to be in a particular room, we're gonna to try to do that as much as possible. And if there are five foods in the current diet that are actually pretty healthful, we're gonna focus on giving those foods more often, try to introduce other nutrient dense foods and slowly whittle away the ones that may not be so helpful. So it's not a, you know, some people can take on the cold turkey. I think that's very hard to do. But for many people, it's more of a, I don't know if you all remember, like when your kids were young, if any of you actually used formula, the standard was that if you were weaning your baby from formula in a bottle to other beverages when they got older, you would start with an eight ounce bottle of formula and then you would put in seven ounces and an ounce of whatever the other thing was whether it was milk or whatever. Then you would go to six and two, 
and five and three until ultimately the child had transitioned gradually from a taste they weren't used to to one that they became used to. The same thing used in this case. You want to just start by adding a little bit of a new food along that somebody feels comfortable with, not necessarily doing a sea change and kind of disrupting their world by taking away the things that they feel safe with and adding things that are making them unsafe and feel stressed. But it is a slow, slow, tedious process. So let me ask if they are seeking a nutritionist, what's the best way to find a nutritionist near them? What's the best way to find a nutritionist? Yes, a, a, a knowledgeable Okay, so uh, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which I'm a member of, has a find a dietitian directory. My recommendation is to, you can use that. And they have within the directory, there are people who specialize in, there's a group called Dietitians and Functional Medicine. And you can look and see which dietitians actually specialize in your area in functional nutrition or integrative health. Those are the ones who are gonna be the most aware and, and able to help you with these types of challenges. Um, you know, a dietitian that's an expert in diabetes may or may not have anything, you know, may not, not know this area, but ones who are doing integrative medicine often will. Um, CNN, CCN, sorry, certified clinical nutritionists are also really smart and have very good training in nutrition. So if you have a CCN locally, that's somebody else that may be worth using. Um, those are the two you know, the two types of you know, credentials that I think are the safest and best to use. 